automate things. And automation is what we do. <laughs> why, why would we ever want to manually test a system? Now, there are moments where it's a good idea to put your eyes on it. But that's a small amount of time compared to the vast suite of features that we test every time. The uh, picture you see on your screen, that picture, the hands there, are the hands of the QA manager. The QA manager is holding out a document for me. The document the QA manager is holding is the table of contents for his manual test plan. It is not the manual test plan itself. It is just the table of contents. He has 80,000 manual tests that he must run every six months. He sends it to an army of people in India in order to do that. It costs him a million dollars every six months. He's holding this out to me because the year is 2008. The financial crisis has begun, and he's just been told that his budget is being cut by 50%. And so he's asking me, as he holds this document out to me, which half of these tests he shouldn't run. And I told him, well, you can cut the document lengthwise or depthwise or horizontally. It doesn't matter. You're not going to know if half your system works. This is the ultimate result of manual testing. Manual testing always ends up with you losing the tests. And there are two primary primary mechanisms behind this. One of them is the one I just described. Eventually, the accountants can't stand to look at the, at the QA cost anymore, and so they start pairing it back. But the other mechanism is much more insidious and much harder to find. And it comes down to the fact that the developers don't deliver on time. <laughs> QA has got this big plan, right? They, they know how long it takes them to test their system. And if the developers deliver at this date, why then we'll have enough time to test everything. And of course, the developers don't deliver on that date. But does the shipment date change? And the answer to that is, of course, not. And so what do the, what do the QA people do? Well, <laughs> the QA people start to make decisions about what should be tested and what shouldn't be tested. They do impact analysis. They said, well, that feature didn't change. So we probably don't need to test that feature, but this feature did change. So we probably do need to test that feature, ignoring the fact that the software is so interconnected that any change anywhere can break virtually anything. <laughs> and you lose your tests. You lose your tests. I don't expect that. I expect automation. I expect the entire system to be tested with automation to the extent feasible. And that feasible extent is pretty damn far. Now, like I said, you do have to get your eyes on things. You do have to, you have to look at the screen. You've got to assess that screen for its uh, non, what is the word? The, the kind of quality that must be assessed by a human being. There are certain things that simply have to be assessed by humans. But the vast majority of features can be tested at the push of a button. I expect that we cover for each other. This is, a, um, this is the way a team behaves. We talk a lot about software teams. We like to use the word team in software. But have you ever thought about how a team actually behaves? Imagine a team of players on the field, moving the ball down the field towards the goal. And one of the players goes down for some reason, and there's no flag on the play. So the play continues. What do the other players on that team do? They change their field positions to cover the hole, and they keep the ball moving down the field. We cover for each other. In any team, software team or otherwise, people go down. It happens. Bad things happen. You get sick. You have a fight with your significant other, whatever. You know, some weird thing happens. And for some period of time, someone is non-functional. They might even be at work, but be non-functional. And the rest of the team needs to be able to cover. How do you do that? Well, you'd better know what each other are doing. You better not be in silos. You better not isolate yourself from any, everybody else. You better work closely with each other. If you're a programmer, you should probably sit down with each other on a regular basis and code together so that you can see what's going on with somebody else. If you're a QA person, maybe you should be working with some of the other QA people or maybe some of the programmers. We want to have a nice cross-pollination of 
of knowledge within the team so that when someone goes down, the team can still cover for them. And in fact, it is your responsibility to make sure that there are others who can cover for you. I'm not a person. I expect honest estimates. Honest estimates. This is a, a, a fairly contentious idea, you know, that we have to actually estimate things honestly. What is the um, the most honest estimate you can make about a software project? And the answer to that is three little words. I don't know. Because that is the truth. You don't know. You don't know how long something's going to take. You don't know if you can make a date. You don't know what it's going to take to build a software system. Nobody does, right? You can, you can try and come up with wild guesses, but they are pretty much wild guesses and they can be off by several orders of magnitude. So I don't know is the most honest estimate you can give, but that's not an adequate estimate because it is not precise enough. <laughs> it's accurate, but it's not precise enough. We need to add some precision to this. Now, how do we add precision to I don't know? And the answer to that is, well, you can define what it is you don't know. You can define the shape of your ignorance. How do you do that? Well, here's a simple trick. And this goes way back into the 1950s. People used to call this PERT, project evaluation in real time. That's what they called it back in those days. Real simple technique. Anytime you are asked to estimate something and you don't know, because usually you don't know, you give three numbers. You don't give one number. You don't say, well, I can get that done in two weeks. No, you say, hmm, well, if everything goes the way, if everything goes perfectly, right, I can get this done in two weeks. If things go the way they usually go, it's going to take me four weeks. And if things go really badly, it's going to take me eight weeks. That's the shape of what you don't know. And that's a, a probability distribution. What you are giving to others is a probability distribution. That is very fair because it says, I don't know. And this is the shape of what I don't know. Now, that shape can be readjusted every week. You can come back every week and say, you know, I think I know a little bit more now. You cannot simply give a date. You need to give a shape. And by the way, what is the job of a manager? I mean, there's a lot of different jobs to managers. They have to manage people. They've got to manage teams, all that. But one of the primary jobs of management is to manage uncertainty. That is kind of the role, right? Okay, well, we've got all these uncertain variables. We're going to have to try and sort them out to protect ourselves and make sure that the, the extremes don't hurt us. When you deliver the shape of what you don't know, you are giving to managers exactly the input that is their job. Managers won't like it. They don't like it when you do that. They'd rather have a commitment. And, and uh, sometimes they can try to coerce a commitment. Oh, you know, by being tough, by being uh, annoying, by being acerbic, by yelling or stamping their feet or throwing a little tantrum or something like that. And that is the final of our expectations. Because I expect that you are professional enough to say no when the answer is no. I don't want you to say yes when the answer is no. You will save your, your company immense amounts of money if you say no at just the right time. Now, you should not go stamping around going no, 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 all, you know, like Batman, Lego Batman. But when the answer is no, you have to be able to say no. To all the junior people out there, I don't want you carrying a sign around that says no, it's a bad idea. You should always be looking for a way to say yes. But when the answer is no, you have to be able to say no. And watch out for this little trick. There's a little trick that you're going to get caught in from time to time. And that little trick is someone will look you in the eye and say, well, will you at least try? And the answer to that is no, because I'm already trying. And how dare you insinuate that I am not trying? There is no different behavior that I can exhibit just because I said try. The fact that I said, okay, I'll try does not mean I'm going to change anything <laughs> because there's nothing to change. I 
cannot try because I'm already trying. Yes, that's Yoda. I know. There is no try. Okay. That's the end of my talk. Thank you all for your attention. I uh, hope you enjoyed yourself and learned a thing or two. And with that, uh, I think we've got a little bit of time for Q&A, if there's some way to do that Q&A. Absolutely. Thank you, Bob. Um, folks, please be very loud and clear and to the point and succinct in your questions. Someone can just throw one in. Don't be shy. Because Bob is not. <laughs> folks those are intimately engaged in forecasting and and doing promissory notes to senior executives now it's the time to ask yeah hi bob uh thanks for the talk i really appreciate it um i've enjoyed it heard it a couple of times now how <laughs> do you address uh these objectives amidst a team where it does not seem that uh, everyone is motivated to care for these objectives. <laughs> how, do, how, do you, how do you deal with this in a team where, where people aren't motivated to be professional? Well, um, there's an easy answer to that and there's a hard answer to that. Um, and the easy answer is in the United States, it is possible to fire people. There are other countries where it's not possible, but sometimes you just look at them and say, sorry, you don't belong in this team because you do not have the necessary motivation. Now, you don't want to do that if you can avoid it. Is there some way to uh, use peer pressure? Is there some way to um, do pep talks? Maybe. Maybe there's a way. Maybe there's some way that you can, you can massage or maneuver someone to behave more professionally. Imagine that you are the captain of a ship. And the, the crew you've got is the crew you've got. Right? You can't, it's kind of hard to fire people when you're at sea. How are you as the captain of that vessel going to get the appropriate level of discipline, the appropriate level of performance out of the crew? <laughs> the military has kind of solved that problem, although maybe the, uh, maybe the approach is, is uh, not something you want to implement in a company, but those are things to think about. Thank you for that, Bob. Uh, thank you for the question, Stephen. Uh, anyone else will take another question, maybe two? Oh, and by the way, uh, everyone's um, to everyone's attention, Bob's content will be then shared uh, as per the uh, link that I shared in the chat. Another question? Bob, how do I shut down uh, management when they say, I understand estimation, but still tell me how many days? Well, I, well. <laughs> the way I would handle that is that I would I would continue to give them three numbers. Right? Okay, well, you know, how many days? Well, uh, you know, five, 10 and 50. Th those are the numbers. I can't really do any better than that. There is a chance it might be 50. There's, you know, a chance it might be 10 and there's not a very good chance that it might be five. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't know how you do better than that, you know. And yeah. yes, they, they, it is very common that managers will come back at you and say, I need a number. I've got to have a number. I'm sorry, you can't have a number. I, I can't honestly give you the number. If I were to give you a number, you it would force me to lie to you. And I'm not going to lie to you. So here's the truth, right? 5, 10, and 50. That's the truth right now. Come back to me tomorrow. I might give you slightly different numbers. S Thank you, Bob. So consistent with the binomial distribution around the median 90% probability, right? You know, don't, don't, don't precise, don't give a precision answer in software development. This is not serving, this serving, um, servicing. Folks, anyone else will take another question before we have to wrap up. I have a follow-up to the previous question. What if the date that they need is based on a marketing campaign, a rollout for some new product? And if they don't have a fairly accurate number, they don't know when to do their marketing campaign. What do you do with them then? Yeah, that's a problem, isn't it? That's a management problem. And uh, I don't know what you do with them, right? Now, now, one of the things you can suggest as a development team is to say, well, what is the absolute minimum product that you can survive with? And we can probably give you a, a, an estimate with a narrower distribution on that minimum project. 
on that minimum set of features. That's one way to address this, but that's only a, um, a minor adjustment. I mean, the reality is, is that if, if the business has set themselves on a course for a certain date and they don't know that they can achieve that date, they cannot coerce the developers to somehow make that date. <laughs> that doesn't work. And, and we have all been in projects that missed that date and everybody went you know, crazy and went, oh my God, we're going to miss the date when everybody knew long in advance that the chances of making that date were very low, but no one would admit it to themselves. Everybody kept on holding out hope. Agile, the reason, or one of the primary reasons we created Agile was to destroy hope, right? We, we execute our, our projects in short little iterations. We measure how much we get done in those iterations. We take those measurements, we project them forward in time, and we get very bad news from that projection. And we want to look at that very bad news, and we want to make decisions based on that bad news. If that bad news is hidden, and a lot of a lot of agile teams do this, right? They'll hide the bad news. They don't want to show the outcome of their velocity. They try to hide, they 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 won't expose it to management. That violates the whole the whole point behind agile. Agile was not a way to go faster. Agile is a way to know just how screwed you are and then to do something about it early <laughs> instead of late. This is great, Bob. Thank you very much. Um, we, I know we had the hour, and I, I know your time is uh, limited as well. I really want to thank you for coming out today and giving these, um, you know, very salient, very uh, honest, unsanitized, I would say, authentic points, pointers that people have forgotten over years. This is probably um, one of the, you know, one of the better, best uh, talks we heard, and. Uh, I really wish this is once hopefully gets recorded well, gets propagated all the way to chain of command of those organizations where sadly, um, as you call it, lies prevail. Uh, and hopefully people hear it and also talk to their senior leaders and, um, and et cetera, and uh, hopefully make things straight. Thank you uh, very much for coming out, folks. Thank you all for joining today and, uh, and listening. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, thank you uh, to you, Bob. Content that Bob has shared with me and uh, will be sharing uh, later on is going to be available. So if you want to actually learn from Bob directly how to write clean code <clears throat> or bring his series in your uh, respective organizations, which I strongly recommend because I watched it myself many times, uh, reach out to Bob directly. Okay. All the best Thanks, to you. Bob. Be thank safe. You. Uh, be well. Bye, everybody. Have a great week. Thank you.